it was like love at first fight, you know? Like I, I really fell in love with the sport then and my love and passion for the sport has grown as I've actually grown into the sport. Colin Nomaganjani Nathan is a name that many associate with success in the world of local boxing. As a trainer, coach and manager to numerous boxing stars over the last decade, his nickname means no matter what, which makes him the perfect guy to have in your corner in this most uncompromising of sports. Female IBF Africa Junior Welterweight Champion, header the Shredder Volmarans, is someone who can attest to this. Nathan believed that there was something special in the 33-year-old when the two started working together in 2015 and have created an unbreakable bond ever since. The two have had to quite literally fight for every opportunity to build Hedda's career. Mind and Field, brought to you by ProfMed, intelligent medical aid for professionals. I love boxing with all my heart and I, um, I miss my dad. It's that connection that I have with boxing and him that, that's very close to my heart. My fascination for boxing started at the age of four with the gloves. I was given a pair of gloves by my late dad and seeing my parents obviously wake up for Kiri Kutsia in the early hours of the morning and I just hear them screaming at the television say, come on Kiri, you know. There's a story that I love telling people about my late dad and I remember him coming home wearing this white Sanyo tracksuit top that was sponsored in the 80s for boxing and these white pants and these white leather shoes and I always used to say to him, Daddy, where were you? And he says, Colin Key, I was at the boxing. And I was like, Daddy, I want to go. And he kept saying to me, Colin Key, you're too young. And I nagged and I nagged and he took me to a boxing gym at the age of seven. I'm not sure if I chose boxing. I think boxing chose me. In 1990, I got legally licensed as a second through the late Marcus Temple in the Western Cape Boxing Commission. Uh, back then, the old act had no age restriction. Now you have to be 18 or older. And I actually started going, tagging along in the corner when I was like 10 years old, nine, 10 years old. And they always used to chase me away from the corner. And then the late Marcus Temple put my dad aside after the tournament and he said, why don't you license Colin? There's no age limits. So in 1990, um, in standard four, at the age of 12, I got licensed. I think people are still giving me those skewed looks even today. <laughs> um, I grew up into boxing. I mean, boxing, like for me, was, you know, like most families go to church on a Sunday, we went to boxing on a Sunday. That was kind of culturally ingrained in my family. So that was family time. That was where the three of us at the time could connect through sports, which was crazy because I, I just, I, like, I was just so fascinated with boxing. Now I find fast, fighters fascinating. You know, they've each got a story why they box, why they want to become champion. And, and their journey and their dreams in the sport. There has to be that, that chemistry and that good synergy between myself and my athletes. 14 years ago, I was involved in a South African title fight where my fighter took too much punishment and my ego overruled my logic and sense and the fighter ended up collapsing. And it was a very, very frightening lesson. And because I really disliked the trainer that I was going up against. Uh, I was young, uh, in fairness, but I was still, I still was wrong. I still made a mistake. And it's something that I realized then that you, know, you can't let your ego keep a fighter in just because you have a disdain for someone or dislike or you want to win at all costs. Since that lesson, which was really harsh, I have been known to stop fights. I have been known to throw in the towel. I have been known to let fighters sit in the stall between rounds because inevitably you're not dealing with just that athlete. You're dealing with that athlete's future and it's your responsibility for you to ensure that that athlete can see his kids, grandkids walk in a straight line. That fighter puts their life in your hands during that fight. The fighter, thank God, was okay. Um, went into hospital for observation but made a full recovery. 
but I could have very easily gone south, even, you know, to the point where, God forbid, he could have been fatally injured. It's a serious sport. It's a very deadly and harmful sport. Brutal sport. Beautiful, which is such a contradiction. But the truth of it is, you play soccer, you play basketball, and you can play tennis, but you, you, you don't play boxing. I'm very blessed. I think I've built up such a good resume and name in South African boxing that fighters actually call me out and they say, would you be able to guide my career, manage my career, train me, advise my trainer or manager or consult um, for us or for me that I'm very blessed. I mean, I really, really love what I do. I'm very passionate about what I do and I'm also very passionate about the athletes that I represent. I've done well in the sports. I've done well with my athletes. And if you look at the athletes that have really excelled with me, they've been loyal to me and I've been loyal to them. When I get behind my athletes, I put my heart and soul behind them. I will fight every inch, tooth and nail, for the best possible deal for that fighter. Because if the fighter succeeds, the whole team succeeds and we all look good. So it's the fighter first and it's all the people around that fighter. And I always say that the fighter is the star of the show. We merely part of the cast. So I'm only sitting here doing this interview because of the athletes that have chosen me. Um, they have a choice in their careers and they've chosen me and I've helped them propel their careers to become champion of the world or obviously change their lives. My fighters have one career in their life and it's boxing and they've chosen me to guide them and to, to get them the best fights and the best opportunities and that's my responsibility to them. When I promise a fighter something, I will go to the ends of the earth to fulfill that promise. Broken promises are the worst lies. Hedda initially kept her boxing efforts a secret from her parents, but she knew she wanted to make a life out of a sport that gave her something that nothing else could. Her partnership with Colin is the key driving force behind the success they can now be so proud of. I followed Hedda as an amateur. Um, I was really impressed with her, her commitment to the sport. And then I think it was just kind of a natural progression. I think every amateur boxes amateur with the dreams of becoming a professional. I had a friend who was, was training at his gym and I went to train there a little bit and sort of hung around and started like nagging Colin, nagging him and, and saying, listen, I want to turn pro. And when Hedda approached me, I was like, I had this relationship with her already, so I wasn't going to turn that down. And he just kind of said, you know, boxing is, is in a bad state right now in this country because there was a big boxing blackout where it wasn't on TV because of some lawsuit, which meant women's boxing was in an even worse place, um, not getting any exposure at all. So he told me, like, it's going to be hard to get your fights and stuff. But eventually he said yes. I just thought to myself, like, here's your opportunity to, to produce your first female champion. and. He said, I'm going to be his first female world champion. And we're still working towards that. But uh, the rest is history, yeah. It was an easy choice. I, I, I'm hoping it was an easy choice for her. But for me, it was just like, absolutely, let's, let's do it. So when I was in uh, primary school, I did athletics, netball, soccer, cricket, and tennis. And then when I went on to high school, I focused on tennis. I actually did homeschooling and, and attended a tennis academy um, until I was about 17 years old. Yeah, and then um, after that, played a bit of club soccer until boxing found me when I was about 22. I always wanted to learn how to fight growing up. Ever since I can remember, I wanted to learn how to fight, but my dad wouldn't let me, you know, he wasn't too keen on the idea. So as soon as I could do it on my own, I went for it. I guess I just really wanted to, to punch, to punch people, punch things. It was just that, literally that desire to use my fists. That was, uh, that was the thing, yeah. I think 
Boxing is so hectic because you need a, a balance of like strength, power and, and endurance every round and you've got a limited time to recover. And the reason I actually turned pro was I was just a little bit frustrated with the way things were run and I didn't like people telling me what to do. So I decided to turn pro so that I could take my career and my training into my own hands and make those kind of decisions myself, um, like about my conditioning, about uh, who my coach is. When I have a fight coming up, all I think about is the fight, um, especially, you know, getting a few weeks closer to the fight. I become a super, super focused person and um, I'm quite selfish with my time. You know, I don't do any social engagements. I really only think about the fight um, and what I need to do and stuff. And uh, my life becomes very regimented. Like everything needs to run like clockwork. I don't like to stray from my routine at all. Then a week out from a fight, I take it much easier and it's kind of like a time to breathe and be like, cool, my body's ready. Let's do this, you know. So Colin will tell me what I need to do and uh, we'll, we'll work on a game plan and practice specific things to be able to implement that game plan. And I run those things through my head. If I've got footage of my opponent, then I, I watch that footage quite a lot. I try and implement these things in sparring as well. Fighters can walk into the ring, one person, and they might walk out the ring not being that one person. And their life is compromised because this is a hurt sport and my fighters trust me with their lives and it's a responsibility that I take very seriously. Colin is a very hard worker you know like I work very hard in the gym he works very hard outside of the gym guiding the careers of all his fighters and strategizing for fights. From a business perspective when I sit down with my athletes I'm not going to promise him the earth and the world when I can't deliver that. Um, what you see with me is what you get. I'm not here to mince my words. I trust Colin with my life. I, whatever he says, I do. There's a, there's a serious, serious um, bond of trust between us. And I just think he's got such an eye for boxing. You know, he sees the the reality of stuff and is able to make the best judgments in terms of guiding your career and in terms of training for a fight or a specific opponent. He just, he's, he's got it down to a T. He knows how to make the, the right decisions, you know, when to choose the right fights. Um, it's literally if we're in a boat, I'm paddling as hard as I can and he's steering. That's, that's how it goes. Yeah, so if we keep doing that, um, I'm gonna achieve my goals. Heather takes her profession and her boxing career exceptionally seriously. And for me, you know, she loves talking boxing, she loves doing boxing. She's got a great boxing IQ. Uh, mentally, she's developing, and it's great for me to see that development. You've seen guys during COVID particularly either stagnate or, or develop during COVID. And because of there was just no broadcasting, there was no sports, Hedda was in the gym during that period and developing. And we've seen a lot of not just female athletes and male athletes too, because not out of choice, because they had no option, but they developed. And, and she developed mentally. So to see her rise from, you know, being this good of a fighter, elevating her levels up, for me it was like, I sat here and I thought, jeez man, she's really, really taking it seriously. So, determination, the will, the seriousness of a career, and obviously the commitment to what she needs to do as a professional is, it's just breathtaking sometimes. One of her issues is she overtrains and what I've done now, particularly for the last fight, is I actually said to look, I mean, I've been at this level, listen to me. So I actually slowed her down and kept her optimum for her to be in, in a 10 round physical fight. And that's actually what turned out to be. It was, it, was, it was a war of attrition 
but it was a fight not just physically she had to win, but mentally within herself, and she, she leveled up. He didn't give me any tactical advice whatsoever. He really just psychologically lifted me up. And um, I really think that's what makes a good coach, to be able to do that. Tap into your fighter's brain and just get them out of whatever hole they're in, you know? Hedda technically is really, really talented. And her skill set's better than some guys I've seen. And I just think, you know, like, in the beginning it was really tough, but now, you know, we had such an epic fight earlier this year with uh, Serrano and Taylor. And that was at Madison Square Garden, it was sold out. Uh, it did big numbers on, 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 one of the, on one of the streaming platforms. And that made people realize, like, wait a minute, you know, females can box too, they can really fight. And for me right now, that has to be contender for fight of the year, because they both let it all hang out. I've always found that that scariest moment for, for any fighter or any trainer or manager is that moment where there's a knock on the door and the floor manager says to you, it's time to go to the ring. You gotta do that walk. And that is a very daunting experience. And once you get out of that and you get in the ring, everything else is cool. There's no feeling like that. There's no feeling like those nerves. There's no feeling like being in that ring and punching with those little tiny eight ounce gloves. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it, I cannot compare it to anything. The thrill is just so, so big. Header before would always naturally be nervous. And you just try and calm her down, try and settle her in. Um, do I get nervous as a trainer? Yeah, absolutely, of course, you gotta feel something. But sometimes you gotta fake it until you make it. But, I mean, as a trainer, you have to feel something. You have to feel anxiety. You know, I, I feel very comfortable in the dressing room knowing that my athlete's in good shape and we've got a good game plan and, and the athlete at hand can really fight it, can adapt and listen and follow the, the, the instructions in the corner. But by and large, you've got to feel something. So with Hedda, sometimes she's very nervous and sometimes she's nervous, but she's, you know, calm, if that makes sense. She's still, you know, with it. But in her last fight, she was really nervous. And you just gotta try and just keep talking and just trying to keep her calm in those situations. Particularly as she's walking to the ring, because that, like I said to you, that can be a very daunting experience. All boxers need to be in the best shape come fight time. But the true champions are the ones that can match physical with mental excellence. At one point he asked me, um, he was sort of like, how long have you been boxing? And I like sort of looked and then he was like, never mind, but it's been a couple of years. And um, he was sort of like, this is your moment now. You can be good or you can be great. You need to decide. And I got up and I decided to be great and I was really, really tired. I was finished, but I just found something inside me or it found, it found me and uh, I pulled it through. I've never said this before, but I'm gonna say this and, and I don't think I've ever expressed it before. That, that win meant so much to me knowing that I could get through to a fight. And now, a lot of people felt that it was a very close fight. Some people felt that we lost, some people had it a draw, some people thought we won. I thought we nicked it out in the championship rounds, round seven from, I thought we swept the last three, four rounds, and that's what was the decider. It was a close fight, so I'm not gonna dispute that, but I think I'm gonna take a lot of credit for this win because in the early rounds, besides the first round, which had a won because she was, you know, very tentative and nervous and she was really snapping the jab, she really kind of got stuck in the moment where she wasn't boxing like she boxes normally. Mentally, I could see her just kind of quitting on herself. And effectively, you have 60 seconds, but you have 45 seconds or 50 seconds, and it's pressured, it's pressured. And after the fifth round, I could see mentally she was quitting on herself. And I could see it draining out of her. And I looked at her and I, she, 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 was, she was 
bending down and I actually picked her head up and I said, look me in the eye and I said, look, this isn't about your opponent. I remember both, this isn't about your opponent. This isn't a physical issue, this is a mental issue. You physically are better than her, you're a better fighter than her. This is now a mental battle within yourself. And you need to pull yourself towards yourself and go out there and box her nose off. Because this isn't about her, this is about you. When I'm in the ring fighting, the whole crowd is shouting instructions, but the only voice that I hear is his, which is something quite amazing. At the beginning of each fight, he always whispers in my ear just before the bell goes and says, can you hear my voice? And I say yes. And then his voice is the only voice I hear going forward from there. Um, that's a big thing. And I think that sparked the, the right energy in her. And I think that's what switched. And I think that's what won us the fight. It's not because it's a collective team effort. And it's the first time I've ever said that I'm gonna take a little bit more credit as a trainer than I should because she collapsed mentally and I picked her back up. And it's very good being a good corner man when you're winning a fight. It's really hard to be a good corner man when the chips are down and you've got to pull it back. And we really, really pulled it back with Heather. So that to me was such, forget about the belt, forget about the win. To me, there was an emotional win and an emotional connection win with my fighter. And I'm very proud of that moment. The biggest lesson over the years has been um, learning when to rest, you know, learning recovery, the importance of recovery. Um, just because you're not doing great doesn't mean you need to push harder. Sometimes you need to just tap off and let your body recuperate a bit. So everything to do with recovery, recovery, eating, sleeping, um, massage, you know, anything that's going to help you recover faster. You need to look after your mind, like it's important to give your mind a break sometimes. Just step away from the gym and the boxing and, and focus on something else. It's, it's very, very important. So when a fighter gets in the ring, he, he or she should always be in shape. You should never lose a contest because you're not in shape. So that's why I think boxing is just such a mental sport. Where it's like really is 80% mental. Like sometimes fighters are cutting weight badly or they're not well when they get in the ring or mentally they're not there. Well, it goes back to what I'm saying. Mentally, they're not there. You know, we've seen some fighters who've lost a parent or a child and they get in the ring six, seven weeks later and they perform at the highest level. We've seen some fighters get in the ring and they're just mentally are not there. Boxing really is a mental sport. The only opinion that matters to me is uh, that of my coach. Yeah, and that of m my own opinion. Once you start throwing punches or getting hit a little bit, it all goes away and you are in the fight. Because this is the moment that you've been working for and you've just got to go into the fire. There's, there's no secret, she's in the world ratings now. She's rated by the WBC, she rates by the WBA, and she's obviously now highly rated in the IBF. I want her to fight for a world title, so I'm gonna push her as hard as she can go, and I want, I want legitimacy for a career. I want her to step up, and I want her to get in a situation where she's a mandatory for a world title, and it's either sink or swim. And I want to get her to that point where she knows and I know, and, and if she's good enough to be champion of the world, that'll be up to her. Hedda is the one whose hand is raised at the end of a successful fight. But behind that hand is a story of partnership and shared passion and sacrifice. And when that's in sync, there's no telling the levels of success that are still to be seen. From the professionals behind South Africa's diverse professionals in terms of providing leading medical aid solutions, we look forward to following her endeavors as Hedda sets out to claim a legitimate world title. For more episodes of Mind and Field, visit profmed.co.za. Mind and Field, brought to you by ProfMed, the intelligent medical aid choice for a diverse range of professionals.